So it may seem at first glance at the book, when you look at it, that it's maybe sectarian in nature, right? In search of Ali ibn Abi Talib's codex or that there was a separate codex altogether. Um, but actually it's not sectarian at all. And he doesn't conclude it in a sectarian manner. I think it would have been quite easy to make it sectarian because the backdrop of the collection of the Quran is the Prophet's demise. So uh, the book I've chosen to speak about is In Search of Ali ibn Abi Talib's Codex, History and Traditions of the Earliest Copy of the Quran by Saif al-Din Kara. Um, and this book was written as part of Professor Saif uh, PhD thesis. And the reason why I chose it is um, firstly because I had the honor of actually interviewing the author um, a few months ago. So I had a, quite a first-hand insight into it. Secondly, because um, it intertwines both Ulum al-Qur'an and Ulum al-Hadith, both of which, alhamdulillah, I have the honor to teach. And also because I feel it's a very novel and noble contribution to academic scholarship in the field um, of Islamic studies, and especially the textual history of the Qur'an from the Shi'i narrative. Okay, so the book is divided into quite succinct chapters. Um, what Saif Adin does is he goes into first the, the, um, the Orientalist or Western narrative around the textual history of the Quran, um, which the, the belief around it has been based on, you know, the revisionist theories um, of the past um, and Orientalist scholars who maybe didn't view Islam very favorably, nor the Quran. And so from there, vantage point, the Qur'an was not necessarily, it wasn't a given that the Qur'an was a divinely revealed book. They believed that the Qur'an grew organically from the Muslim community um, and was inspired by Judeo-Christian revelations and scriptures. And so at best, the school of John Wandsborough, for example, dates it back to 200 years after the death of the Prophet. So Saif Adin gives us a background into Western scholarship around the textual history of the Qur'an. Then he goes on to give us a tra the traditional Muslim narrative um, around the history of the Codex. So his, when we say textual history of the Qur'an, we mean when it came to be compiled and when it became like an official Codex. So the traditional Muslim narrative goes, um, the, the first Caliph Abu Bakr, you know, compiled and collated, you know, his personal copy um, and then asked Zayd ibn Thabit to make a copy of that. <clears throat> and then when it came to the third Khalif's time, he kind of collated and compiled. He made a committee of 12 people who collated and compiled um, an official codex, which was then sent out to all the different centers um, of, of uh, a growing Islam. <clears throat> and that became the official recognized copy. Um, now, what happens in this traditional Muslim narrative is there's no mention of any of the ahadith we have about the Shi'i narrative, which is about Imam Ali staying in his house for almost six months um, to collect and copy down the Qur'an. Um, and, and, and those particular ahadith have largely been ignored. So what he sets out to do then is to investigate the Shi'i narrative um, and using the exact same methods that current Western academia used to date textual history, which is called the historical critical method. He uses the same tools to then date these Shi'i ahadith. And what he does is he doesn't, um, so he, a lot of the book is textual analysis of the hadith and kind of rijali analysis, I would say, of the narrators in these chains. So he, he analyzes between about 27 to 31 ahadith of different variants to the same hadith of Imam Ali staying in his house, not from Shi'i sources, from Sunni sources themselves. Um, so he uses, for example, the Musannaf of Abd al-Razaq al-San'ani, the Musannaf of Abi Shayba, um, a hadith from Ibn Sirin, and um, which were first century kind of texts before, before the canonical collections of Bukhari, Muslim, etc. in the second and third centuries before kind of Sunni orthodoxy became crystallized as a thing. Um, so he uses actual Sunni sources and what he does is he investigates the narrators, the circumstances of the narrators, you know, where they hailed from, um, etc. And what this is known as 
is this pioneering method of dating called the um, Isnad Gammatan method um, laid down by Harold Motsky. So Harold Motsky used this method um, to date the early history of the Quran using this, you know, traditional Sunni sources. But now what Saif al-Din does is he uses that same method, which is recognized as a credible method, but brings in the Shi'i narrative um, and essentially sheds light on something that has hitherto been ignored in academia. So his aim, in his words, was to actually kind of bring the Shi'i narrative as a serious, um, credible source of history and of information when we've got, you know, so many thousands of ahadith that Western academia has actually ignored. Um, so that, that was his aim, to actually bring Shi'i ahadith to the forefront. Um, and instead of using al marijal which a lot of academia kind of don't consider a serious, credible method of dating a hadith, because they consider it a circular argument that you're using a hadith to corroborate other hadith. Um, so he uses the historical critical method, essentially. Um, so it may seem at first glance that the book, when you look at it, that it's maybe sectarian in nature right, in search of Ali ibn Abi Talib's codex, or that there was a separate codex altogether. Um, but actually, it's not sectarian at all. And he doesn't conclude it in a sectarian manner. I think it would have been quite easy to make it sectarian because the backdrop of the collection of the Quran is the Prophet's demise. Um, so it would have been easy to kind of politicize it and to kind of get sidetracked by the who collected the Quran. Um, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't focus on that at all. And he, his main focus is when. When was the Qur'an collected and compiled? And it's more a process of dating. Um, and he comes to quite a unified conclusion that would, that kind of is in congruence with the traditional Muslim narrative. Um, but it includes the Shia narrative, which is not all that different at all. Um, so it's not sectarian. I think it would be very good reading um, for Muslims from, from all denominations. Um, and the conclusion he comes with is also very close to what carbon daters conclude from, say, for example, the San'a manuscripts or, you know, other palimpests that have been found or the Birmingham manuscript that the, the earliest copies of the Qur'an were actually no more than 15 years after the Prophet's death. Um, so, you know, it, it's all kind of coming together where only 20 years ago they were talking about 200 years after the Prophet's death. And now, you know, you've got, you've got these dates that are much, much closer um, through this Isnad Kamatan method. Um, and so it's, it's almost kind of bringing the Western narrative closer to a unified Muslim narrative um, and also bringing Shi'i hadith to the forefront. Um, so, yeah, his focus is mainly on the when and mainly on um, kind of almost uh, encouraging Western academia to view the Shi'i corpus as hadith as, as a credible source. Um, when until now it's, it's, it's been ignored and, and in his own words, he was saying how it, when he was researching his, for his master's thesis, um, you know, there's, there's always this kind of uh, notion in Islamic studies academia that there's a scarcity of primary sources, that there's very little material. Um, and he said it, it was frustrating that there was this whole body of Shi'i material that Western academia ignored or didn't take seriously. So that, that was his aim in writing this book, um, that there were this, so many narrations on the same event that, from Sunni sources themselves that, okay, maybe hadn't made it to the canonical sources, but were still credible and datable. Um, so it's, it's, so the book extremely interesting for anybody who is interested in the textual history of the Quran. Some parts of it are quite technical, um, especially when it goes into the actual dating. Um, and I would say it's quite mathematical, right? There's, you know, there's tree diagrams and, and all sorts um, going into, you know, the various narrators in, uh, in, in each variant and each strand of each narration, if you like. Um, so it does get technical. Someone who does have a background in Ilm al-Rijal would lap it up, I'm sure. Um, but that doesn't say it excludes anyone else. 
Um, but I would say it's largely suited to people already in academia or interested in Islamic studies, um, budding students. And I feel that what he discusses in it actually opens up the doors for budding academics in, and gives them ideas into what they could research in. He himself felt that it's quite a nascent um, topic, the textual history of the Qur'an, and there is a, still a lot of work to be done on it. So for anyone kind of considering ulum al-Qur'an, the early history of the Qur'an, um, and hadith, because it overlaps into hadith and rijal as well, um, it's, an, it's an excellent book to read.